Hi everyone, we're going to start now. My name is Emily Zivin. I'm the Illinois Chapter Social Worker here in Illinois, and I'm going to present with, um, tell you about Survivor's Guilt. The way this talk is going to work is I'm going to do a brief overview and talk to you about Survivor's Guilt, the history, some symptoms, talk about how it pertains specifically to Huntington disease, and then I have two great volunteers here, Char, Char, Ry, I'm going to say it wrong, Char, Charlotte Rybertech messed it. And Joe Wiedemann, they both um, have spent a lot of time volunteering with Huntington Disease Society, so they'll tell you about their stories of um, being HD survivors and um, how they've been involved with our community. And then lastly, at the end, I really want this to be an open dialogue. I want to hear your stories. I'd really love it if you'd share your questions with us. But this is being filmed, so if you could say your question, then I'll repeat it, and then whoever you want to answer the question will answer it. So again, I'm Emily Zivin, and I have no relationships to disclose. Um, and it, this is just an educational workshop. If you have any questions or need any advice, please consult with your primary care provider or your neurologist or any other healthcare provider that you might be working with. So before I go into talking about survivor's guilt, I want to just talk about the feeling of guilt because we all experience it many times a day. We feel guilty that we don't spend enough time with our loved ones. We feel guilty about something we've said to somebody, but we're usually able to talk ourselves through this and figure out how to overcome those feelings very quickly. But with survivor's guilt in the many different forms that it takes place, it takes a really long time for us to recognize the symptoms, understand why we're feeling that, and figure out how to move on and live a productive life. Um, what's interesting about survivor's guilt is that it's not a specific diagnose within the diagnosis within the world of psychology. And in your handouts, it says the DSM-4, but the most updated book is the DSM-5, so I apologize for that. So that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. It's the guidebook for psychologists and therapy, therapists when they're giving out diagnosis. And survivor's guilt is not a leading diagnosis. It falls under the event of post-traumatic stress disorder, or otherwise known as PTSD. So it's a result of having post-traumatic stress from an experience. And these experiences are often a life-threatening situation, a, tra a trauma or catastrophic event, or an illness. And the, what's interesting is that the origins of survivor's guilt when researchers started looking at it, the symptoms were from Holocaust survivors. So those people that had survived being in the concentration camps or being in war had all started showing very similar symptoms. And throughout, over time, people, re researchers realized that the symptoms that the Holocaust survivors had were very similar to the ones that survived a catastrophic event or illness, and they were all kind of under the same umbrella. So the definition of survivor's guilt was expanded to people that were experiencing the same symptoms. So for those who experience survivor guilt, it, it indicates that it's a wrongdoing on the part of the survivor, and it indicates it's, it's an indication, an expression that you feel guilty even though you haven't done anything wrong. And when we look at survivor's guilt with Huntington disease, there are two, two main issues, which I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with, but there's the sibling relationship and the parental relationship. And siblings tend to feel guilty because depending on how many are there and who tests positive and who tests negative, siblings tend to feel guilty that they have to watch their other siblings suffer through the, the disease while others don't have it and can live you know, the life that the other siblings would want to live. So there's a sibling affected form of survivor's guilt and then there's the parents. And um, parents, both the HD parent and the non-HD parent, both ex experience survivor's guilt on very similar levels. And with Huntington disease, it's um, expressing guilt is a way to take control because you can't take control over passing down the disease and who gets it, but you can control how you feel. So that tends to be why guilt it manifests in a lot of people who we tend to describe as survivors. And it's really important as you progress through resolving these issues to realize that there is no one to blame, no one can control who, who gets the flip of the coin. And it's something that needs to, takes a lot of time to get to, but people can resolve these feelings. It just takes a lot of work with therapy and communication and help from loved ones. 
So what are the symptoms of survivor's guilt when you're feeling kind of angry and not the way you normally feel? You, you get these results, you find out you're negative, you want to be elated, but you're not. And you're feeling issues that might be doing self-harm to yourself as if like you deserve to not feel good. And so sometimes people tend to do things to hurt themselves because they are no longer deserving. Um, some other symptoms are sleeplessness and experiencing nightmares, a loss of motivation, hard to get up at night, hard to get to work, hard to do things that you possibly love to do at one time. There's a reduction um, or disinterest in self-care, an increase in ir irritability, an un un inability to um, enjoy those successful moments that you're having li in life, and also generally just feeling disconnected from people you were once connected with. And the symptoms and effects are very similar, but I just wanted to kind of give you these two lists. Um, and again, the effects, of, the effects of survivor's guilt is feeling guilty all the time and not be understanding why you feel these, feel, feel these feelings, sleep disturbance, extreme anger, a low tolerance for stressful situations, little things that once you didn't, didn't bother you at all are all of a sudden really irritating you and you're having a hard time dealing with these little moments. Um, creating future tragic events, increased use of drug and alcohol, and physical symptoms such as headache or dizziness, stomach aches or racing. And um, it's important to realize that it's, there are such complex feelings. And part of the thing is that when people choose to test and get their results, they expect to be so excited. And they think like, oh my god, if I test negative, I'm going to be so happy. But many people do not feel that way, which is really interesting. And so um, it's really important to go and get help and talk to people to help you resolve these issues. And the other thing is that people might, in, on the reverse end, is that people expected that they might be, that they were going to test negative, they were going to test positive. And when they test negative, they might have made life decisions already based on the fact that they were going to have a terminal illness. So it's kind of but people who test positive have different different um, experiences or thoughts that they thought they were going to have, and the same things for those that test positive. So how do you cope when you're feeling overwhelmed or underwhelmed by being negative and stressed out that some people in your family are suffering with this disease? It's really important to connect yourself to people that you care about and remind yourself that you're not alone. If you look around this room and come to a convention and come to your state conventions and reach out to your local providers and community, you'll realize that there are a lot of people experiencing the same things that you are. And it's really important to reach out to other people and not be alone. And remember that healing takes a long time. And I kind of want to plug in this, the whole idea of going to therapy, because for so many years, like you think of people look at therapists as going back to your childhood and talking about all these issues, but there's so new advances and different kinds of therapy and treatment you can get. And one of them is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is just a therapist who specializes in this specific area, but their focus is on like your issues. So they look at the things that you're feeling and right now, and then they come up with solutions and they give you tools. And so it's a way to really come up with ways to live a more productive life while talking to a therapist and kind of embrace you and help, help people move forward. Um, and realize that there is no offense in surviving, that people who test negative, your families are happy, your loved ones are happy, like there are people that are really happy that you are here. It's important to reach out to others and tr uh, others that you trust to keep a daily routine and eating healthy and exercising. You know, for a lot of the neurological um, diseases, exercise is really important and we get these extra boosts of energy. So exercise always helps when you're not feeling good. And as I mentioned before, to talk to a mental health professional. So there was a there, there's not a lot of research on this as I was trying to look at books and see if I could find any statistics, but there was a study done in 2001 in the Western Journal of Medicine, and they, I, they, did this, um, they did a study, and what they found is people who receive low risk experience significant difficulties dealing with their new status. And as I mentioned before, it was that people had made decisions thinking that they were A, going to get the disease, or set these expectations that they had to live these fabulous lives if they tested negative. And it's, a really, uh, it's, a, it's an expectation that's really hard to fulfill. 
So I want to kind of go into when you have survivor's guilt, ultimately you would know that you were negative. And the reason, and testing is such a personal decision and it's one that's not, cannot be taken lightly. And each DSA has put in spe specific guidelines for predictive testing to make sure that you are in a secure, safe place to go ahead and A, make the decision to get tested, and then also with people who can help you with your results. And I just wanted to kind of, I'm sure most of you know this, but I just wanted to kind of talk about it. It's not a law by any means, it's just guidelines that we really try to enforce that our center of excellence is follow. Not every doctor follows, like not every neurologist does, but we try to encourage, one, you have a telephone contact with your center, your, your geneticist, you talk about the potential of getting tested. Then you go in for your first visit, hopefully with someone, a loved one, a family friend. You sign a consent form, you meet with a genetic counselor, you have a neurological exam, and your blood drawn is taken at that time. And then your second visit, which varies from place to place, you'll come back, definitely not alone. You come with someone else, and you get your, um, your results, and you arrange for a post-follow-up test, and post-follow-up, and then you're, you, if you need to come back, the doctors will follow up with you for another visit. And I was trying to find exact statistics for how many people test um, for do predictive testing. And the best I could find was 10 to 15%. I think it usually falls around 10. But I know tomorrow when you find out about, we talk more about research, there are studies that are most likely going to be coming to the states, which will help, which will address some issues of people who are maybe asymptomatic. So I think those numbers might increase. And they'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but obviously some of the reasons to test are family planning, um, just wanting to know and wanting to plan for the future. So I just want to just go back a little bit and say that feeling guilty is just is something that we all feel. And um, it's a long road to learning how to be productive and lead a life that you want to, but it's it's possible for every single person. And when if you're feeling bad today, it doesn't mean you'll feel bad tomorrow. And just really surround yourself with people who you love and who can help you get through times when you're feeling like you can't get up. And so now I'm gonna open the topic for Charlotte to share her story. Now I feel really short, there we go. So I'm gonna first just tell you a little of the history of my family so that you know why I might have survivor guilt and then I'll talk about the guilt itself. Um, I found out that HD was in my family when I was in grade school. So you know, you know there's something but you don't know exactly what it is. Um, my mom was not diagnosed until I was a junior in high school. And of course at that point I had genetics in school and stuff and so now I knew that I was at risk as well as my sister who was a year younger than me. My mom passed away when she was 39 I was 21 years old, um, and talk about guilt. We had an argument, and she walked out the door and never came back. So I've, I've dealt with a lot. <laughs> um, I, I do know now that that was not my fault. Uh, then there was about 10 years, I will say, of calm and cool while my sister and I got married and had children. Um, the test was not available when we made the choice to have kids, so we had to decide what to do, and we did choose to move ahead with children. My sister then was diagnosed when she was 32. Her children were about six and seven years old, the same age as mine. So now I had a sister that was sick, and I was the one that was going to mainly be taking care of her. Um, my dad was still around and helping, but of course he's older. Um, she had Huntington's disease for 15 years, so we saw her through losing her job, losing the ability to drive, losing her children to a ex-husband who was not wonderful, um, and having to place her in a nursing home ultimately because we, we couldn't provide the 24-hour care. Um, again, that can make you feel a little guilty. <laughs> um, but you know, we worked full time. I, I couldn't have her in my house full time because I wasn't there to take care of her. My dad, it's the same thing. Um, my sister then, after about 15, 16 years, passed away. She was 46. Um, that was about six years ago. She actually passed away during the Minnesota Convention, one of the few that I have missed. Um, now, during all this time, of course, I know I'm at risk as well, um, but I am the older sister, and you do get somewhat, I did, get a somewhat false sense of security, of course, that 
well, she's already sick, and my mom was sick by the time she was 32, 33, and, you know, now I'm getting close to 50, and I'm still not showing symptoms. So you, I did have that false sense in my mind that I guess it's not going to be me, which is weird because the entire time growing up, I thought it was going to be me because I'm the spitting image of my mother. So I went from, oh, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it, to, oh, I'm probably not going to get it. So finally, at the age of 51, in 2014, I was tested um, mainly because I, had, I have two sons, and the older one got married, and boy, I wanted to be a grandma, <laughs> and I was not going to let him make that choice without knowing for sure what his risk factor was. So I was tested in April, and um, the Friday before Mother's Day, I found out that I was HD negative, that I was not going to get ill, which was such a relief. Probably not so much for me, because my husband would take care of me. It would be fine. But my kids could do what they wanted with their lives. So that was such a great relief. But this is also where some more guilt comes in. Because I was thrilled to call my children and tell them they were fine. And then I had to call my two nephews, who I love as if they are my children, and tell them that I was fine and I would still be supporting them while they were at risk and while they made decisions to test or not to test. And I know everyone's guilt is different, and I love that you had the whole list of the different things. I did not self-harm. I did not have a nervous breakdown. I didn't have any of that. But you do have thoughts in your head. <laughs> you know, why me? Why not me? Why her? Why them? You know, why do they have to be at risk? You know, but, you know, they were wonderful. And as young people are, so much more resilient <laughs> than sometimes we are as we're old. And I called my kids first and did that and told them, and they were thrilled. And then I called my nephews. And thankfully, they were both together because they live in different states, but they happen to be visiting. And I said, I'm so glad you guys are together because I'm calling to let you know I tested negative. And they both just were as thrilled as my own children were, even though they knew that it could be them next. And I just thought, man, they're awesome kids <laughs> and adults. I should correct that. Um, and they have continued to be, and I continue to support them um, as they decide to test or not. One of them has tested and never picked up his results. And that's okay with me, because I told them whatever they decided and whenever they decided that, would, that I would support them. Now, I also, like I said, I had, you know, still the, the guilt from when I was taking care of my sister. You know, Huntington's patients are not easy to deal with all the time. Some of you may have had this experience that they, you know, they, they argue and they tell you you're wrong when you know you're right and resist any help that you might be trying to give them. So, you know, I had guilt for, okay, I'm, I'm healthy, taking care of her. You know, if I were the one that were sick, I had a wonderful, I, I still do, have a wonderful husband. He would have taken care of me. Why did it have to happen to her who had the divorce with the nasty husband? You know, why did it have to be that way? Because I would have been taken care of. I, I had no doubts about that. But, you know, none of us know what our plan is in this universe. So I have taken all that guilt and channeled it. <laughs> I have channeled it into doing what I can for everyone who does test positive. Because, you know, I've been involved in HDSA for over 20 years now. And it isn't just about my family anymore. It's about all of your families. It's about all the families in the support groups and the chapter. I'm, I'm involved in the Illinois chapter. I'm the treasurer. How could I possibly walk away from all of the families? That would really cause my guilt. So I channel all that guilt into doing what I can as often as I can and to the best of my ability. That does not mean throwing my entire life into HDSA. I have lots of other interests. I have a new grandson. He's a year and a half old, the love of my life. There's a lot of positive. So even though I have those little guilty thoughts sometimes and I have to deal with those and, and why wasn't it me, which sounds like so weird to say, I deal with it and I use it and I turn it around for a power of good. And that's my story. And now I'd like to invite Joe Wiedemann. He's going to share a little bit about his family and his survivor guilt as well. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Wiedemann, and I'm from a Huntington's family. I'm the youngest of five children. 
my folks had a slightly late start in marriage due to six years of service in World War II for my father and were married within about three weeks of when he got out. My mother was probably showing HD symptoms from about when I was born. I remember a conversation before I even went to kindergarten that she thought she probably wouldn't have that much more time and she wanted to show me some things related to the family. My mother was one of eight siblings. All of her brothers and sisters lived to their mid-80s with no incident of hunting, incidents of Huntington's. Her father lived till mid-80s. Her mother lived till about 60 and had no signs of Huntington's. It starts somewhere, and that may well have been the situation with my mother. She had no idea the path she would travel. In all the preceding generations, we didn't have a history familiar with grandparents, uncles, aunts, and so forth who, who succumbed to Huntington's. My mother, older brother, two sisters died with Huntington's, all with about a 15-year demise. I have a brother a year older than myself who's not tested, nor has symptoms. I took the genetic test about 20 years ago and I'm gene negative. My wife and I cried when we got our results. So thankfully the chain was broken before my children and grandchildren could have inherited the gene. I have eight nephews and nieces from my siblings, three are gene positive at around age 40, five are at risk, five more in the following generations. I read the definition of survivor's guilt and concluded it certainly does not apply to me. Hearing Emily's descriptions, I'm probably gonna change my self-diagnosis. Maybe change it again tomorrow. The illness in all of our families absolutely affects us. I realize the hardship that HD families endure. I have regrets, if not guilt, that I didn't participate more in helping when my father took care of my mother. We all did, we were there. You grow up with it and you just step up to the plate as, as required. Many of us have watched our parents, siblings, spouses, offspring, and HD acquaintances live with, fight, and succumb to this illness. In the words of my esteemed colleague, Charlotte, after her sister died, she had a, an article in the newsletter and, and she concluded it with, these are the things that have made me the person I am today. It's a beautiful statement. We hope we can help, if only a little, though help, some help very much. Charlotte served in every board position in the Illinois chapter, a couple of other things with HDSA, pretty commendable. HD has been a disease of silence and secrecy for many generations, which in ways has been detrimental in awareness of the illness. With awareness comes compassion and research. Research is so increasingly hopeful. Medications are being improved and, and come up with, uh, they don't all help everybody the same way. Studies of the brain, are progressing at an astonishing rate, yet not fast enough. Clinical trials are available and I've participated in three or four even after I'm gene negative. They're helpful. They may help somebody you love. Surviving this, surviving this adversity takes a lot of character and we see it throughout our HD community. Good luck to all of you, all of us. Does anybody have any questions or want to share their story or have any great words of advice? I will. Okay. I'm a chapter social worker and I work with our genetics clinic and, and, and lived through some of the things you're talking about or pretty much all you're talking about. And one of, one of the folks that's come to our clinic, they're five siblings and only one is gene negative. And not only does she have survivor's guilt, it's her life.
Okay, I'm just going to repeat the question. I'm just going to repeat what you said. I'm going to summarize it. So she was saying that she's been helping a woman who's a, had five siblings or one of five? She's one of five, the only gene negative. Okay, she's one of five, the only one that's gene negative, and, and she's been helping all of her siblings. She lost her husband, too, it sounds like. Through divorce. Through divorce. Through divorce. And so how do you tell someone like that to stop, take a breath, take care of themselves, take some time? have a life, right, technically? That is a great question. Okay, I only had one sister to take care of. And I remember, because we would fight a lot, because, you know, they, are, they tend to lash out more at the person they are closest to, and my sister and I were like this, so I always got yelled at. She never yelled at my dad or anyone else who visited her. Everything was me. Taking care of her was difficult, even in the nursing home, because I would go visit, and, you know, I never did anything right, according to her. And... I remember the social worker at that time saying to me, and, and this might help, she said to me, Charlotte, if you don't have to be the caregiver, you can be her friend again. And in my head, that made all the difference, and that may be something to say to her, that she needs to take a step back, take care of herself, so she can spend a little time just sitting with them and being their friend again, being the sister again, instead of being the caregiver all the time. It just always stuck with me that I was told that. And, and it allowed me to not feel guilty that I didn't visit my sister every single day. You know, I went twice a week, dad went once a week. You know, there were kids to be raised and stuff. I, I couldn't be there all the time. And, and she has to do that because someday they will be gone and she still is going to have to have a life beyond that, which is part of the whole being the survivor. It, it, it's hard, but there's going to be a day that comes that she won't have those four to take care of and she needs to do quality over quantity, taking care of them less and doing it better will, will just be better for her and for them. Thank you, that was great. Anybody else?
He was just saying that he has an uncle who has HD who he hadn't spent a lot of time with, and he removed himself from coming to convention for four years. And in hindsight, you wish you had spent more time with your uncle and not pulled away, because it's hard to see someone slowly deteriorating and come back to the community. But I just want to add, it's OK to step away. I mean, it is overwhelming. And so stepping away, you've been it's been proven. like nobody, They missed you, and they're glad to have you back. And so it's important to know your limits and when you need to take a break. I think I share that experience pretty well. Uh, I have a, a brother a year older and myself are the only of five that, that are not HD positive. And becoming acquainted with Huntington's uh, after living our entire youths with our mother sick with it. My brother, you know, is like as far away as much of the time as could possibly be, which was kind of how I was as a kid. Helped my brother get into a nursing home for his last couple of years. And at least try, he was nearby, so visiting twice a week. Get to know some of the people in the nursing home. They're, you know, they're happy to see you if you recognize them. And I got my other brother to, you know, Pick Charlie up a pack of cigarettes and, and deliver them, and he got onto a, a routine with that every week. And like you say, it's, uh, it helps because you know you've participated, participated a little bit, and your family loves you. They want to see you. And it may not be easy, but it'd probably be easier than not doing it. Thank you. Did she had a question in the back? Do you want So she was saying that she's a mom and her daughter is at the end stages, last stages, and she's in a nursing home and she can't step away. And I think that's, I think as a, as a mother, I think that's a, a more of a challenge as a parent to, to step away, understand why you wouldn't want to. Do you do, do you do anything for yourself to? Okay. So she was saying that she lives three hours away from her daughter, and they didn't know about the disease, and it's really hard to detach. Do you have any words? I don't know that I have, have anything useful enough for you, but I will tell you this, because I babysit. That's my full-time job. I babysit. And all children, whether or not they have HD, have trouble letting their moms leave. So try to let go of a little bit of that guilt when you have to leave. You know what I mean? Think about all the kids at preschool that first day that cry. It, it, it's awful. It, it, I am not minimizing your pain at all. But even if she were a perfectly healthy little girl, she might cry when you leave and be upset. So if they, I can alleviate that one little pain for you having to leave at the end of the day. I hope that helps. I, I just want to add, just because there's n new things with technology, do you, does she, is she speaking or is, can you not speak to her? So you can't even FaceTime her or talk to her? Okay.
it's really hard. She was saying that she's, it's just, just hard to watch her daughter deteriorate and she's trying to be the best mom she can. And it's just hard, it's hard to watch. Do you go to support groups? Counseling. She said counseling, and I just want to add that I know a lot of therapists don't know about Huntington's, but just know that your chapter social workers and your, your social workers at your center of excellence can call your therapist, and they're not asking for any information about you particularly, so we can call and do a, do a, like a little talk about what HD is so that you don't have to do that, and so that they understand what they're going through, and it's, it's I, I just did it for somebody. I think it's really helpful because, I mean, somebody who doesn't know about it could read about about it but I think when you have a conversation let them ask questions give them a bigger picture it's really helpful so utilize your staff that live near you or you know someone that's in your region because we can we can make that transition easier for you so that you can talk about yourself and your feelings and not so much about do the education of what Huntington disease is for them So he was saying that his brother was diagnosed three years ago with Huntington's. I think you need to surround yourself with other people, like right here, right now, because it's hard to talk to other people who don't experience this, because even though you might have shared experiences of loss, Huntington's in itself is a different disease. It's different than Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And so I think it's important to be with other people to let them guide you on that, because and, and, they understand how you feel but it is incredibly painful, but you're still, you are still allowed to live. And so is your, bro and so is your brother to that extent. And like your life is, ju is still just as important as it was the day before he was diagnosed. I think it's important to remember that. Where do you start? You start by crying a lot. <laughs> I, remember, I remember a day sitting at my kitchen table shortly after my sister was diagnosed and my, I had a friend over and I remember just sobbing into the table because my sister was going to die, as if she was going to die tomorrow. And it wasn't tomorrow. It was 15, 16 years later. And you know what? In those 15 and 16 years, even though parts of it were awful, we shared ice cream sundaes, and we went for walks, and we looked through scrapbooks, and I made her a scrapbook of herself so she could see it before I had to put it out at her funeral. I wanted her to know how much she was loved. There are so many things you can do because he's not gone yet. And let yourself feel it. Let yourself, it's okay to cry. It's, o it's okay to feel off. I would be crying if I wasn't speaking in front of a room full of people. <laughs> it's okay to do all those things. And it's okay to do those things with him. It's supporting him to let him know how sad you are that he's going to be ill. That's okay. But don't let it keep you from having the wonderful memories that you still have time for. Because when that person is gone, when my sister died, I threw out all the pictures of her in the wheelchair. I only kept our happy life together. Because that's what I wanted to remember. And, and I, I think that's important. So make the happy memories. Cry when you have to cry. And laugh when you need to laugh. And create some memories now while he can. Yeah, that, that's an important concept, actually. When I, when, I, when my first convention was three years ago, and there was a woman talk, talk to the social workers about how her husband had Huntington disease, and how even though he couldn't speak, she, on his birthday, she loaded this room filled with balloons and just made like a celebratory event for him because even though even though he couldn't speak she wanted him to still feel joy and I think once people are diagnosed it's so scary and it's so hard but we have to remember that there are still pe people that people with Huntington disease can be happy and can still be in life and volunteer and be parts of families and and it's important to keep the memories going and create good happy times together
Yeah, he just said to do simple things together, create happy memories. He made a documentary of his dad so that he could remember his dad in better days and hold on, hold on to those memories and continue to have family time and be together. Let me just repeat the question, then I'll let you answer. She just said that um, her mom has ha Huntington disease, and she recently, she has a little boy, and she was recently tested, and she's negative, but her brother, she's worried that her brother changed things for her brother because you think he thinks he's positive because you're negative and you feel guilty. Do you want to? And, and he's not here at the convention? Because you're a good big sister. Yeah, so. Well, and the good thing is now because you were here, you can say, you know, I went to all these breakout sessions and everything, and you, he, you have a 50-50. It isn't you or me. I, know, I personally know families where every child had Huntington's, and I have met families where every child tested negative. Mm -hmm. So now you can go back and say that, and that may alleviate that pressure from him 
that he thinks he's going to be the one to get it, and maybe he will start hanging around a little more then. Right, right. I just want to summarize that. So we were having a banter back and forth and we were talking about sibling pressures and sort of the, you know, the just empathizing with each other on how we feel. But I just wanted to add to you, I went to a talk yesterday on mindfulness, which is hard to do. And the whole concept is being present in the here and now and taking time out for yourself. And I think sometimes it's like such a great concept, but none of us can do it because we're all so busy and we're all on our phones all the time. But I think in general, and this is just for everyone, like when you're feeling like that, to kind of close your eyes and take a few breaths and like let it out because I think you'll, it I, I can't, do, I have a hard time doing this, but like letting it out and kind of letting go of taking on how he feel, how his, taking on his feelings, because it's so easy to do, we all do it, but to try to be more aware of like what you can do for you and not, and then he maybe can get there too. I know there was another question, was there? Yes. I think they're going to be happy for you. I don't think that just because someone tests positive that they want their, I think everybody wants your sibling to test negative. So I think, you know, I love you. I'm going to be here to support you on this journey. This, you are my family. I tested negative and I am here for you and your kids. And we're going to do this together. We're a team. Like that's what it's about, right? Family is everything. You're still a member of the team. You're going to be the one by their side. I would totally agree with that. I mean, I didn't get my results when my sister was still alive. But I think, yeah, for them to know, hey, I, I tested negative, but I'm going to be here for you is, is the best thing you can say. Because right now they may be thinking, oh, my God, it's going to be all of us and who's going to, you know, who is going to be there for us? So it could be a relief to them. But, yeah, I mean, just like when I had to tell my nephews, knowing that they were both at risk, they were like, that's great, Aunt Charlotte. You know, it, it, I think sometimes we think it's going to be worse. You know, it was hard for me to even get the words out. But once I said it, they were like, that's awesome, you know. So I think sometimes, yeah, we, we try to take on what we think everyone else is going to do. Yeah. And I just want to add, remember that they're happy that you're here. They're happy that they're just, rem like, no one is mad at you for surviving. They're happy that you're here. And live that life to the best that you can and do everything that you want to because the truth is we could all walk outside and get hit by a bus tomorrow or diagnosed with stage four cancer with this disease we we know more and it's very scary but be the best sister you can be the best mother that you can be and just it's a gift you know and i remember back when
And I know I always thought about it after my mother passed. My mother passed away right before Thanksgiving, and so it was just me, my dad, and my sister. And I remember my dad saying, we're going to decorate the house for Christmas, blah, blah, blah. And I remember thinking to myself, you know what? My mother would roll in her grave if I did not put all her decorations out. You know, and after my sister, we didn't, you know, so while they're alive, you're still going to do all those things with them. And when they're gone, what do you think they would want you to do? You know, I think that my sister, while she was sick, didn't want me to just be sick with her. I think she wanted me to keep bringing her milkshakes. And thank God someone could still drive and could go pick up pizza and bring it to the nursing home and stuff. So, you know, maybe looking at it from that side, that you're the person that's still going to be able to do that for them. You're going to be their tie to real life on the outside at some point. The current, you want to know the current, who take, who, who gets predictive testing? Only between 10 to 15 percent. I think it's lower. I think it's closer to 10 because I tried to circle back to the national office to find out. In general, but you, you can't, you can't test before that unless a, a child is showing symptoms and then they need to test to confirm diagnosis. I think you need to realize that you can never change what somebody else says or what somebody else's feels. And so you need to work on how you feel and how reactive, because she might be aloof for some totally other reason. So it's really um, figuring out how you are going to be with her and not let that make you feel bad. Um, how you get there is a journey that is, I, I can't, there is no exact tools. It's like, do you exercise and it makes you feel better? Could you do that before you go and see her? Do you want to go to, you know, a therapist and do deep breathing and think, you know, there's or mind, mindfulness or meditation or something that will prepare you for that? Because I think it's a, it's a journey in your head, how you can have a relationship with her as she's going to be distant to you right now. Doesn't mean she won't circle back. I think we have to wrap up, so I'll take one more question.
Okay, I just want to sum up since there's, okay, so she was just saying that we need to give, let people sometimes be a little bit aloof and give them distance when they need to, and also kind of put a plug in for cognitive behavioral therapy, which is CBT therapy, and it's really problem solving and reframing your, your, how you're thinking, and it's not so much going back into your past and things, it really is solution focused and a really good way to, to accept new, new coping mechanisms. Thank you. She just said that we need to, our feelings of guilt, we need to acknowledge that we're feeling guilty and, and move past it and realize like it's not our fault and take, you know, take the bull by the horns and, and move, move on, you know, like accept that that's how you're feeling and find ways to be productive and not let it consume you. Thank you.